supply chainers wherever you are in the world. This is Sarah Barnes Humphrey with you today. Are you ready? Let's talk supply chain. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's tuning in. Um, I'm happy to be uh, hosting today on behalf of Sarah, who's traveling. Uh, my name is Audrey Ross. I am currently the Import and Export Compliance Manager at Orchard Custom Beauty. We're a award-winning business-to-business private labeling company specializing in beauty tools, cosmetics, and bath accessories. Uh, I'm joining you here from Toronto today, which is starting to get a bit more overcast as we head into our more wintry weather here in Canada. Um, I'm excited for the show today. We've got uh, a good friend of mine, Brian Glick, is joining us. Um, he'll come on a little bit later. Um, and in the, we'll start with um, a little bit of a, a note here from our Fast and All sponsor. So say you're at work and all the lights flicker and then go out. You try to move and bump into something. You turn and bump into something else. You can't work like this. You need to be able to see what's happening. And this is how your inventory feels. So Fastenal has a unique inventory solutions that send data to the cloud and help you avoid stockouts while not carrying excess inventory. Don't stay in the dark. Let Fastenal shine a light on the parts and supplies that keep your business running. Go to fastenal.com forward slash LTSE to see how they do it. So thanks for that. So that helps our, our episode happen today. So some of the things that are coming up, we'll, we'll dive into some of the things that are happening with Let's Talk Supply Chain, then I'll bring Brian up, and then we'll talk about our articles for the day, which I know you're interested in catching up on all those market insights um, and the news that's happening. Uh, so happening on uh, the Women in Supply Chain podcast, uh, Sarah recently hosted TJ Crouch and Brink, so that's episode 372. Um, I love the Women in Supply Chain, Supply Chain podcast series, um, and I know Sarah's also been working on a women in supply chain uh, group um, as part of um, her newest initiative. So anything related to women in supply chain, you want to check that out. The uh, episode 373 of the regular podcast series is part four to the Wise Tech mini series with guest Tudor Maxwell. Um, so that's another um, conclusion to the, the Wise Tech series that, that um, has been going on. Um, again, these sort of podcasts gives you great insights into um, some of the market tools that are available, some of the people that are in our supply chain community um, around the world. So go and check those episodes out. This week, of course, Sarah is attending the Bloom and Vision Conference. So she's in San Francisco spending um, some time at the Fairmont Hotel um, and getting, I don't think she's been to San Francisco. So it'll be interesting to see um, her her takeaways and, and vacay experience while she's been there. Um, and then also coming up on Friday, um, is uh, is the uh, action items with DC Men. Um, so she'll have a great guest for you. Um, that's another one that really covers a lot of um, tech insights. DC has so much expertise in this area um, and really gets um, some insightful guests on there. So I, I again, another one I like tuning in too. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's about what's happening with um, Let's Talk Supply Chain. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on. Uh, so I'll jump in. We'll get Brian up on here. Um, this is a fast show, so we want to make sure we cover our market insights and, and hear more from him. Brian? Hey, Audrey. Hi. So tell me where you're tuning in from and a little bit about yourself. Uh, today, I'm looking out the window. That looks like <laughs> Chicago and O'Hare out, Airport out the window. <laughs> uh, I'll be in New York tomorrow at the Altana um, Summit. Uh, but, uh, you know, my day job, uh, CEO of chain IO and we move the data that moves your freight. So all of the exciting things that have to happen so that people don't have to key data into 14 different systems. <laughs> less of this, more less of, of this. Less swivel neck. We say you got the monitor over here and the monitor over here, and you shouldn't be going like this all day. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Also, just to um, set some ground rules, I brought coffee, so you okay. have to bring the thoughts today. Okay. <laughs> yes, because I, I didn't have a chance to make mine, so I'm, I'm a little off schedule. You're, you're on thoughts. I'm on coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm on thoughts. It's okay. <laughs> uh, so let's have a look. There was a weekly poll um, every Wednesday on the, on the Let's Talk Supply Chain, and they ask, they ask us questions. Sometimes it's sort of fun. Sometimes it's about the industry insights. 
Um, so we can kind of look at that um, and see what's happening there. I'm trying to see what the question was this week. <clears throat> if we can bring it up. If not, we can. So it was, what it. was your top industry tip or uh, networking tip? Networking tip, yes. Right. And, yes, I mean, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting because the the breakout uh while we're kind of getting a link to that the uh the 40 percent said attending industry events uh 26 on joining professional groups and then kind of an even split between connecting on linkedin and mentorship mm -hmm. um you know the thing that i i've i voted in the poll and i yeah. voted for attending industry events but okay. you know what i really would have loved to have just said was be in rooms with people <laughs> like it matters so much right yeah right so. but it's also it's the connections right it's that it's that sort of personal connection of kind of getting to know people a little bit better so even the um you know i i think i i think i voted for um join person join business associations and mm -hmm. but my thinking was the same I, I, we're, we're i'm working away on the OIT, which is the organization of women in trade in Toronto, we have our export awards coming up and I'm working away um, with our with our board on, on putting that event together. And so when I think of business associations, it's not just be a part of a business association, get a newsletter. It's go to the events that they're putting on and meet the people who are part of it. Um, you know, and, and some mostly with business associations, I would hope it's people who are kind of um, looking, having the same, you know, shared values or, or looking for similar outcomes, right? They're, they're people who kind of um, want to learn more and want to meet more people. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's important for people who are listening, who maybe don't have the luxury of getting to go to all of these big events and, you know, uh, you, you've managed to figure out ways to get yourself there on, on a lot of occasions, but not everyone has that, uh, that ability. And certainly I, yeah. I'm privileged because I, it's my job, that's right? Your job. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, you know, the local events, the uh, just the being present in the world, right? Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's just, you know, a meetup, uh, you know, I've been to spoken at Wista events, local ones that have 10 people at them, right? Yeah. But those 10 people, you're going to develop a lot deeper bond at an event with 10 people than one with 10,000. And, yes. you know, it doesn't just have to be, you know, being a future freight this week or being a TPM or, you know, these, yeah. these big mega events, it, you know, there's, and sometimes that's worse, right? If you're new yeah. at it, you know, like it's totally fine it's to just, almost like, overwhelming. let me get three coworkers together that I used to work with and let's go, let's go have a, you know, a meal, like yeah. just be present with people who you wouldn't have been present with otherwise. And things mm -hmm. will come from that. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. I love that. I love that. What, so what's happening in the market in your world with this technology, this background of technology? What's going on? What's the, I've seen some things around emissions coming up on, on your page. and Yeah, I mean, there's a ton going on, right? So, uh, you know, so we'll save some of this for the articles. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the big things that are that in, in the tech space right now, and especially kind of in integration tech is, is you know, there's a huge push right now around how are people going to do all the carbon reporting and, you know, meet all the new regulations, whether that's EU regulations. And there's a, um, a whole list of acronyms that I'm going to avoid throwing out, but let's just say there's a lot of things going on in the EU. Uh, California has a whole bunch of things going on. Uh, and then, you know, people in, in, you know, professionals in the industry have to figure out, you know, what data do I have? What data do I not have? What am I going to need in 2026 and 2027, you know, when when some of these regulations in the U.S. start having teeth on them? Yeah. Um, and then in other parts of the world, you know, the, you know, taxes on containers and their carbon usage that goes into effect in January. Yeah. And, and most people are not, you know, really aware of how that's going to affect their budget or, you know, the that they may be behind the, the tide. You know, one of the interesting things I heard the other day. Uh, there are a lot of large organizations who are looking at bringing things into places like North Africa and transloading because yeah. the the way the regulations are Regular. written, and this is a little bit, feels a little bit like cheating, but the regulation is on the last leg before it enters Europe. So if you, yeah. you know, bring something into Morocco and then transload it and then move it, 
you know, into Spain, mm -hmm. you haven't, you know, that's, I, I suspect someday somebody will close that loophole, but yeah. you know, this is what the, there's haves and have nots when it comes to the supply chain. And that's what the haves are doing. Yeah. And the vast majority of companies are just trying to figure out how much they're going to have to pay the, the carrier next year. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it, and it was a bit confusing. It was something, um, some of you know, I've been off work for, for a few weeks, but that was one of the things I, I saw kind of this, the C, CBAM or carbon border adjustment mechanism start to come in for Europe, which is, I, I do a lot of work in, in Europe. And I panicked because it was like, oh my gosh, I haven't, <laughs> I don't even know what this is about. I've got to figure this out and I'm going to be away. Um, you know, and, and luckily for me, it's not so far on items um, specifically that we work on. You know, yeah. and, there's, and there's a graduation process or, or a sort of tiered process of how they're how they're implementing it. But it does make you start, you know, it, it's becoming very real. Yeah. And, and the real thing right now is probably you just want to make sure you know what all the words mean. For instance, yeah. you and I were just actually talking about slightly different things. So right. you were talking about CBAM, which is yeah. the tax on the carbon produced in the manufacture of the goods that you're bringing right. to Europe. I was right. talking about the ETS, which yes. is the emissions trading system, which is the tax on the actual container movement of the right. goods, which are right. two different yeah. things that many, many people are going to confuse because the timelines around them are, are similar. The yeah. um, you know, and again, you know, we, we've got some little guides we're building at Chain to just just to be helpful in this. It's not really right. our core business either, but. Uh, you know, we see, we, we sit in this intersection point of all the tech in the, in the industry. So, you know, oftentimes we see a lot of this and, uh, you know, if anybody wants to ping me or ping or ping our, our yeah. brand account, whatever you call that on LinkedIn, uh, you know, we're happy to do little briefings and, and, yeah. and share the things where, where, um, we're hearing from, from some of the companies we're talking with. Yeah. And that's, I think what we have to be more mindful of is, is, you know, you're, you know, sort of tech company. But it's not simply logistics tech in that it's the movement of the goods. It's, I mean, it's the movement of the goods, but then it's all of those compliance and and related aspects that go into it, right? Like it's it's very much your 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 big picture, um, while also being very detailed and 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 nitty gritty. Right? Yeah, and I mean, it's it comes from the fact that we as a company are logisticians who build tech, not yeah. tech people who saw a market. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the, you know, the way we break it down in internally when we talk with our customers is there's two big things that you use technology for in logistics, execution and insights, right? Mm -hmm. So execution is the, you know, what you and I were talking about before we got on the air of like, I need milestone updates in my system so that I can know whether I need to, you know, issue a delivery order, right? That's just the day to day. And then insights is, carbon, forced labor analysis, uh, trying to figure out whether you're procuring your freight effectively, your your audit and pay programs, like all the things that are where you have your core supply chain and, and transportation, and you're going to take that data and add more data to it so that you mm -hmm. can make better decisions. And carbon falls into that second category. But in order to do that second category, you actually kind of have to make sure you're good at the first one, right? If you're not moving your freight effectively and you don't have clear visibility and you're not having automated those processes, you're really going to struggle when it comes to like, all you're really going to do is go back to your forwarders and say, uh, could you tell me how much carbon I used last year? And you're going to have to trust their answer. Yeah. And I'll tell you, because we talked to everybody, they're as blind to this as you are right now. Yeah. So, you know, be careful, be careful about just trusting everyone's answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it is good, you know, as uh, Lars Jensen had told us uh, at last year's CPM, it, it's good to get a number. It's, you got to start getting a number. You got to start having a benchmark. It is because then you can figure out whether that number is right or wrong. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just start with it. the number four and then go. Yeah. Higher or lower. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's take a look at our first article. Um, so today we're talking um, about investors have stopped feeding the supply chain. So we've seen, I think, <laughs> both of us right on the front lines, a ton of money kind of come in or be thrown around or be talked about. Um, and it looks like, um, you know, from about 2018 to 2022, we've got about $50 billion um, poured in in sort of seed through growth financing to supply chain related companies. 
um, startups raising billions like Lineage Logistics, you've got Flexport in here, um, you know, and, and I think we're still waiting to see some of the, the real success stories from, from some of those investments. Um, but one of the companies that um, was sort of one of these sort of quote unquote unicorns was Convoy and it just announced, you know, about a couple of weeks ago that they're kind of shutting down. Um, and so we're seeing um, a confirming decline. What do you what do you think about some of these numbers and, and some of this environment? Um, I think that they're so I'm going to try to avoid the hot takes. Right. Uh, <laughs> go on LinkedIn, type in Convoy, yeah, type in Flexport. You will get plenty okay. of hot takes. Yeah. There are no no lack of those. But I want to yeah. I want to bring a little perspective to this yeah. on a couple of things that you can that are sort of pragmatic things to think about. Not in like whether people getting money or wasting money or burning money uh, makes you happy or sad or angry or, or whatever. But like, what does it mean to you? Um, one of the things to be incredibly aware of is understanding that what happened here and what will continue to happen is you had a market where a number of investors who either did or didn't know a lot about the space decided that there was uh, an opportunity to make some big bets. Uh, and these investors know that very few of their bets pay off, right? Which is different than how those of us in supply chain think about the world, right? Like we're going to, you know, we're not the type of people to spread a bunch of bets around the table and know that nine out of 10 are going to fail. Um, what it means practically is that the, that sort of ride is over because rising interest rates globally um, mean that that money is a little more expensive. So companies are a little less excited to just spread some bets around if those are supported by, you know, debt or the alternative of lending that money on a, on a more sure thing. Um, combined with the fact that a lot of these, let's call them like generation one companies in this VC world took, benefited from the fact that people were not clear about the difference in, in different kinds of companies, right? And so companies like Flexport, companies like uh, Forto and, and, and Convoy are what we now call um, digitally enabled providers, right? So they make money, not because they, somebody buys their tech, but because you buy the service and they're supposed to provide that at a, you know, a, better, a better service for less cost which is why people would invest in them. Uh, that's a really rough business now that supply chain rates are down. Like they're just as affected as, as a C.H. Robinson or a Maersk who, who laid off uh, 10,000 people this week, uh, wow. you know, greatly affected. Um, and then there's sort of pure tech companies that, you know, good ideas that are poorly executed are not going to be very successful right now. And uh, bad ideas that are well executed also not. So it's it's becoming harder out there. But the thing I want everybody to understand, and WeWork's a great example since they declared their bankruptcy yesterday, you have to really read and understand how this affects you. If you have a desk at a WeWork, you can still go to your desk tomorrow. Bankruptcy yeah. does not mean out of business. It may. And you have to actually read the articles, not just the headlines, and understand whether you know, what's the risk? Like if I'm using a software, uh, you know, hosted software and that company starts getting articles written about them, well, you should definitely have an alternative plan and decide how important that software is in your world and what you're going to do if they do close up shop. But you should also read carefully and speak to them about the difference between a company that has to restructure its debt, which is what WeWork is doing, and a company that is effectively completely closing up shop, which in the US is called a, a chapter seven bankruptcy. But the point is that the, set the hot takes aside, you have a responsibility if you're involved with any of these companies to be very clear and understand your risk profile with them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and that's really the important thing is, is to go past the headlines and, and yeah. read the articles and talk to the people if you're doing business with these companies, because it may be that they're going to come through some of this, these debt restructurings. Okay. Mm -hmm. It may be that they're not, but in either case, you should be, you know, hope for the best and plan for the worst. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, I think there's a, 
maybe a geographical or a regional kind of thing as well, because I think in Canada, like we see bankruptcy and our, our regulations are a little bit different. And so mm-hmm. even understanding that chapter 11 and chapter seven are very different, very different scenarios potentially. So I think for, for people who are outside of the U S you know, when you sort of see these, right, you sort of see these, um, you know, you see, you hear the term bankruptcy thrown around. I think that the context is a little bit different regionally. So we have to be mindful of those regulations because it sounds maybe a bit more, um, you know, uncertain than it, than it might be. Um, but I appreciate your point. The, the, the piece here is that, you know, a lot of these, these, um, this market runs on speculation. It runs on, you know, high risk takers and that maybe, um, you know, the pragmatic approach is, is definitely the one to take. Yeah. And, and if you, um, if you hop over and maybe we can get the link, this was not in our prep, but mm-hmm. on the Chan IO blog, the, the fourth article we have right now is one called why you should have an exit strategy before onboarding new logistics software. <laughs> uh, and this is a thing that is yeah. really important is if you're yeah. going to use software, you need, especially hosted software, right? Yeah. That's not installed on your In-house. computer. Yeah. You need to have a plan say, okay, well, what happens if this company shuts up tomorrow, either yeah. because of a cybersecurity incident, because of a bankruptcy, because of, uh, you know, the owner just decide, like I had a software vendor years ago, the guy was going through a bad divorce and we couldn't find <laughs> him for a month. And we needed him to finish processing customs uh, files for us. Oh my gosh. Like it was a big deal, right? Yeah. And it's like, we had to sort of, a bunch of us in the industry sort of became his marriage counselor for a couple of weeks, <laughs> just so we could get our, our, our data can. processed, um, you know, like, you really need to be, you know, read that article. And, and yeah. even if you're calling chain IO, ask the question, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, what do I do if I don't want to do business with you anymore? And what do I do business? What do I do if you can't service me anymore? Me. Yeah. Yeah. It's crucial. It's crucial thinking the end game. And it's not that you want these things to happen, but it's, it's this, it's a mindfulness. It's, it's the reality of these things may or may not happen but you want to have your plan in place so that it's, it's very quick to like, we've thought about what'll happen to, you know, go plan a, this is happening. Let's go plan B, but you need to actually write those plans down <laughs> so that you kind of have them at hand. And so that your that, that your team um, and your company is comfortable and, and, and is ready to go. So. so this is probably a good segue to our next article. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so we've got, uh, we've got Philip CEO, um, the China business supply chain is undergoing major changes. Uh, wh- who knew? <laughs> <laughs> who had noticed that? <laughs> yeah, what I, what I thought was fascinating in this article is this is talking about them making a commitment to produce more in China, right. which kind of bucks the news. Yeah. Uh, but what yeah. what is specific here, and this does match the global trend, is yeah. they're talking about making more in China to support their Chinese market. So this yes. is like nearshoring cuts both ways. Yes. Right. Yes. And so, you know, this is, this is the, the, the principle of nearshoring is you go where your, where your market is and you produce closer to them, which again, helps with carbon, helps with yes. de-risking your supply chain. Um, yes. But it does go in every direction. Right. And it yes. means for much more complicated worlds. Um, the other point that he makes in the, in the in some of the quotes is that tier two and tier three supply chains are still very heavily China dependent. Yeah. So you know they're making uh, medical devices and and what have you, but you know the the people making the plastic widgets or the what have it, you know that is still a very China heavy. So yeah. um, you know for the the these large global supply chains. Uh, getting at that tier two and tier three, this is something I'll be talking about tomorrow at the Altana summit. Uh, But really understanding that is, is the next, it's the next frontier. Yeah. And, and really people need to really examine this because in, in, in our experience, I mean, one, we've, we've stuck with a lot of our China manufacturers. It makes sense for our business and what we're doing. Um, And when we have looked, we do have a fairly agile manufacturing base, but when we have looked to, other countries um, in the region, other countries overseas to do the manufacturing, when you start to get into the bill of materials of like, okay, what what makes up this item? Where are we getting all of these pieces from? Where the raw materials come from? It very quickly becomes like, these all come from China. 
okay, well, can you get them from somewhere else? It's like, no. <laughs> so, so that, that shows that, you know, like even a quick, like, oh, what's your bill of materials, which is pretty straightforward in, in our cosmetics sort of business. It's like, oh, almost all, like those little things all come from China. They come from China exclusively. It'd be either expensive, time consuming, you know, XXX reasons as to why we don't get them from somewhere else at this point. So, so yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's still kind of, it kind of be a hub for, for people. And to your point, to your first point, like, most people forget China's a producer, but they're also a consumer. Yes. You know, so there are a lot of a lot of large large retailers, a lot of what we do. It it it's your consumers are everywhere. Um, you know, not just uh it doesn't just have the reputation there for producer only. I know. Hundred percent. Yeah. Let's spend some time. Um I wanted to say save a bit of time for our last article. Um, and just to mention to everyone who's tuning in, we'll we'll post the links to all of these articles so you can you can uh, read them thoroughly and then um, you know let us know if you agree or disagree with what we're talking about. Um, so we'll we'll uh, our the team will post the links um, in in the chat um, after after the broadcast. But we're going to look at um, our last article is the law California lawmakers California who's usually um, you know quite ahead on on regulations and and uh, and uh, changes here is um, implementing the most sweeping emissions disclosure disclosure rules for big business. Um, so we, Brian and I were talking a little bit earlier Caveat, about Europe. In the US. <laughs> sorry, yeah. in the US, yeah, sorry. <laughs> in the US, we were talking a little bit earlier about some of the regulations coming through from the EU, uh, which is certainly the leader on, on these types of regulations, scrutiny, um, burden, uh, you know, disclosure factors. But let's look at this uh, California sort of climate um, so, emissions. So let me hit a couple of really big points on this, just mm -hmm. because it's such a huge topic. And yeah. we talked about a lot of it already. But yeah. um, the things that we know today, right, and all the rulemaking is not complete on this, but uh, this affects companies with a billion dollars or more in revenue. Okay. However, what it says is in 2026, they have to report their direct emissions. So actual carbon they produce. 2027, they have to report their indirect emissions. Cool. Part of indirect emissions, which are also called scope three emissions, is the emissions from their tra your transportation, but also the emissions from the upstream and downstream parts of your supply chain. So that means if you are managing a supply chain and you are not a billion dollar company, but you have a customer that's a billion dollar company, 2027 is gonna matter a lot to you because <laughs> you said you put a product in Target and you're a $10 million company, Target's gonna come back to you and say, I need emissions data on your production and your scope three and kind of like, what is the, what emissions did you produce? And, and this is the crazy one, and this is more for the product people than the supply chain people. The One of the things that could be in scope, depending on your product, is the usage, right? So if you sell light bulbs, as an example, mm -hmm. the carbon emissions of people using that light bulb for its expected life cycle is in scope for your emissions. Now, if you sell t-shirts, that's probably not a material amount of carbon from the usage of the t-shirt, but depending on your product, that's just, but but I think not, again, this, this could be another hour, but the most important thing to know is this is real. And for, all, for anyone who's spending their time listening to this uh, Thoughts and Coffee this morning, you should expect that you will be asked to explain the carbon emissions of your inbound and outbound transportation. And a lot of companies are gonna struggle even more so with their outbound transportation than their inbound. So, did I get lost there? Cause you're back, right? I'm back. Sorry. I was ranting there for a while. Hotel wife. <laughs> um, don't know where I got dropped, but just this will affect everyone is the short yeah. version. <laughs> the short, the short. Don't read the whole. <laughs> All right. looks like uh, one of us is dropping left yeah. right here. Yeah. And we're, we're, it's time. It's, this it's, is what happens. It's so fast. 
We got the so, we got the rope pulling us off. Yeah, the we're like, okay, stop talking, Brian and Audrey. You're done. <laughs> so thank you, Brian, for being our guest today, tuning in from Chicago. Have a great trip. Have fun in at Altana tomorrow. They had all of our friends. Um, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, Sarah should be back next week um, after her, a great trip to San Francisco. And uh, yeah, follow along and and hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks, thank everyone. You, everyone. Bye.